As I looked at all those industries, they were all facing the same climate shocks, disruptions to their supply chain, stresses on how they manage their waste and how much fossil fuels they're burning. Climate automation came from this idea of saying, these same industries are facing two big challenges. And actually those challenges are related because if these industries need to go through climate transition today, what do they need to do those transitions? Labor, guess what they don't have? A labor workforce. And so to me, what that means is if we see that shortage coming, we need to start investing in automation today at a much larger scale than these folks have ever done. Hey folks, I'm Connor Gaughan, and welcome to Consensus in Conversation, a podcast where we're talking to the innovators, entrepreneurs, and thought leaders who are committed to building successful businesses that also help us build a better world. Today is part two of our conversation with Jay Kapoor of VSC Ventures. For those of you who have not listened to part one, that episode is available in our feed wherever you get your podcast, and we'll have a link in the show notes. I recommend giving that episode a listen. It's a really awesome conversation, and Jay shares a ton of great wisdom for founders on the art of storytelling in business. For those of you jumping right in, a quick refresher on Jay. He's the co-founder and general partner at VSC Ventures, a seed stage investment firm focused on helping visionary founders in the clean and climate tech and automation spaces tell their unique stories to the world. Jay began his career in investment banking before his stint in corporate strategy at the NFL. From there, he ventured out on his own as an investor, first at Launch Capital and then as a co-founder of VSC Ventures. He's also a podcaster, a writer, storyteller, and just all-around insightful thinker on entrepreneurship in the future of sustainable business. I'm still thinking about a ton of things from last week's conversation. Things like how growing up amid a diverse set of cultural experiences creates the mindset of empathy and honest curiosity, and how that's an asset for any investor. How working to grow a product as big as the NFL teaches important lessons about the powerful potential of narrative, experience, and relationships. How VSC Ventures evolved out of an observation that startups have been moving away from one-stop shops for their cap table and looking for investors who have value add in things like PR or storytelling. And how Jay and VSC have gone about making storytelling their own superpower, what they look for in a founder's story, and how they think about retelling that story to make the greatest impact on the world. So with the groundwork laid down, today we're going to get started on Jay's theses on investing in the impact space, the portfolio companies he's excited about, and his vision for a climate tech future. So let's jump into the conversation. Uh, thanks for coming back. <laughs> yeah, glad to glad to take it up for part two. I know we uh, we barely scratched the surface last time around, so good to be back. Hopefully this won't be too wandering, but I do want to catch up on some stuff that I was thinking about after from earlier in the conversation, but then spend a lot of time just on some of the things you think about as an investor looking at portfolio companies, looking at companies in the space that are doing good, like that kind of ethos. As I reflected upon the conversation, thought, oh, wow, there was just more there than I even got to dig into. So I, I know you, you've got this concept of hidden economies, and I would love to dig in a little bit on this. And maybe we start by just defining the paradigm as you see it and then kind of talk about when you think about hidden economies and, and look for those in, as an investor in particular, but even just as a social observer, I'm curious what... What are some examples that really excite you right now in that kind yeah. of paradigm? Yeah, I mean, hidden economies to me, you could phrase it in a couple of different ways. You know, we, we have fellow funds that call it legacy industries, hardline industries, things that are building in the physical world around us that seem so commonplace to us that we don't think about them on a day-to-day -day basis, right? Everybody's talking about generative AI and the advancements there. Everybody's talking yeah. about what was happening with cryptocurrencies on the digital front. And now I think we're going to have metaverse conversations again with the Apple Vision Pro and you know how we're engaging with the digital physical kind of reality. Um, all that's wonderful. There are massive advancements that are happening in construction, in manufacturing, in logistics, in shipping every single day, right? There are massive challenges that are happening in those industries like labor shocks, like climate shocks. And we, I think, as a population, just see them as commonplace. So unless we work in these industries, we don't think about them until they affect us, right? Until a, a failed construction project affects us, until a train derails in East Palestine, Ohio, carrying chemicals. And, and we realize, oh, why is that train uh, three and a half miles long, and there's no sort of uh, uh, guardrails in place to to actually yeah. make sure that something like that doesn't happen. So 
those hidden economies uh, don't affect us until they become headline stories. And so for me, growing up, it was always like, why? Like I was that annoying kid that would always go around to people asking why. Why is it a certain way? And I think that that curiosity has carried with me as an investor today, looking at the kind of stuff that I'm excited about, right? Uh, why is it that we pour concrete in this way? Why isn't there a better option? Why is it the concrete is so carbon emitting? Or why is it that it takes us six people to do this job when we have robots in other industries that can handle rote repetitive tasks like this, right? Why is it that when we send our dry cleaning out, it takes seven days for it to get back to us? Is it labor issues? Is it that that's just the service level that we've accepted? Or is it a better way? I mean, if, if I can do a washer dryer load in a couple of hours, why can't I do dry cleaning the same way in my home, right? So I'm giving you examples of companies in our portfolio that are answering that. Recycling is a great example. We have a company called Glacier. You know, what happens to our recycling when we put it away, right? Here's sort of a, a crazy thing. Only 30% of, of what we actually put in recycling yeah. is recyclable, right? That's crazy. And then a smallest subset of that actually then gets properly recycled when it gets to the plant. Why is that? Well, people are standing in the quality control area, right? So your recycling gets put into a batch sorter. It gets sorted, you know, in large batches. And then it gets put on a conveyor belt where at a lot of places in America, human beings have to stand there and sort out by hand, oh, the batch sorter missed this cardboard or it missed this aluminum or actually this thing that's on the bale isn't recyclable. And this became a massive issue in 2018 when China, which used to take all of our recycling here in the U.S., or the majority of it, yeah. stopped taking it. And the way they did that actually was very clever. They didn't just say we're stopping. They said our bail purity thresholds have gone up to 99.1%. And if everybody was operating at a at a 93% estimate, and now they had to get to 99.1%, I mean, that effectively shut, shut down, down entire opportunities yeah. for these people. And now these plants are saying, well, I am taking all of this recycling and I'm not making any money on the back end. My business model is effectively broken. Yeah. How often do you as a listener think about what happens to your recycling? That is a hidden economy to me. And here's why I think hidden economies as an investor are really powerful. Because most people aren't looking there. And my job, I think, as an investor is to find really big opportunities that are non-consensus today. Everybody's looking at generative AI. Gen AI is consensus. The question is, are you backing the right person in that yep. business to go build a legacy company, right? Recycling is not consensus today. <laughs> People don't even think about it. They, they, don't, they don't know that there is an opportunity to be had there. Yeah. And so to me, I think the opportunity for asymmetric returns comes when you look at non-consensus. And then obviously you have to pick well. And you know we believe that we can do that. That's why we're doing what we're doing. But in order to actually see those unique opportunities, you have to be looking in hidden areas where other people just aren't. Yeah. I love the recycling example. Fun fact for those in DC, don't put your blue bags into your recycling bin. They can't recycle the bags. It breaks the machines. It's my my One of my closest friends is a is very diligent about his recycling. And he would yell at me for three or four months, like, don't use bags in the recycling bin. Don't use bags in the recycling bin. Don't use bags in the recycling bin. In DC, they break the sorting machine. So... The more yeah, you know. and, and it's, you know, 100%. And it's something that like doesn't get communicated enough, right? Because yeah. there's just an acceptable loss ratio that the industry just says, yeah, okay, 30% of what we're going to put out there actually gets recycled. Yeah. Okay. So now think about the people that aren't even recycling yeah. and think about their consumption and how much waste that we are putting into the world today that could be recycled that isn't. And then even the people that are recycling, how much of that is actually making it to the end where, the full, you know, it, yeah. it's the full sort of process. So there's a tremendous opportunity here. Our company, Glacier, is using computer vision to basically use optical tracking of these things as they come down the conveyor belt, yeah. identify them, and then use a robot arm to pick it up and move it across. The real innovation for them is their profile is small enough that it sits where a human being would have been standing for 14 hours doing this job. Other competitors can't do that. They're much bigger, they're bulkier, they're harder to install. Glacier's sort of solution is Build it small, build it nimble, build it purpose-built, and be a no-brainer for these facilities to say, I know I have to meet certain bail purity thresholds. I'm going to do that by you know installing multiple glaciers. They started with one, 
in Recology in San Francisco. They've expanded to multiple ones. Now I think there's a story to be told, which is, hey, we can handle more recycling if we have glacier machines in our facilities. Yeah. And so now I think there becomes a story to say like, okay, don't do those blue bags, but do more recycling because yeah. we know that we can actually handle it when it gets to the facility. One other question I want to ask on storytelling, you mentioned is in your example, I think concrete, which especially because we have this a lot in the climate tech space right now, you know, material science companies, industrial co yeah. companies who are like working on industrial decarbonization, where the product, the service, it's not an easy story for your run of the mill consumer or your kind of mom and pop or, you know, God bless my parents who still listen to the podcast episode, even when it's someone talking about, you know, biochemistry. And my mother's like, I yeah. don't know any of the words that were just said in your entire podcast episode. And maybe this comes down to you and I as kind of intermediaries, as we are the interviewers sure, or the, sure. you know, the working on the publicity and PR strategy. Like, what's the storytelling or the communications vehicle? What is the trick to communicating in some of these more, I don't know, wonky, esoteric industries, sectors, et cetera? You have to find the analogies that relate to everyday life in that regard. I'll give you a, an example from our portfolio. We invested in a company called Pepper Bio. The core thesis behind Pepper is a lot of money is wasted on drug trials because they get to a certain level and then fail. And today, it's just faster for people to move on to the next trial once one fails. There are learnings that are trapped in those failures that nobody extracts, right? And one of those learnings could be, well, if it succeeded at point A, and then a little bit later it failed at point B, what happened between point A and B that we would be able to change? And based on that change, extrapolate if instead of point B, we go to point C and it becomes more successful, right? What am I describing? I'm describing route finding on something like Google Maps or Waze. And that's exactly <laughs> how the founders described the company when they pitched it to us. They said, we are Waze for drug discovery. If there's a roadblock ahead, if there's a traffic jam ahead, we extrapolate how long it's going to take, what a better route might be, and what some of the ways that you should actually take it, right? Maybe it's time to get out of the taxi and hop into the subway because Park Avenue is going to be packed for 40 blocks. And so that's the example that they came in. And once you dig in a little bit further, Connor, it is much more complicated than what I just explained to you. <laughs> but you don't get passed over on the first conversation, right? So right. when somebody comes in and says, look, I'm building microplastic devouring enzymes that are doing this and this, you know, explain it like Pac-Man. Okay, <laughs> what we're building is Pac-Man. These are the ghosts. Pac-Man has to eat the ghosts. Here's how Pac-Man is going to do it. We are powering up Pac-Man. So instead of one, there are hundreds of Pac-Men, right? I, I don't know. I'm just like, I'm riffing with you here. But right. I think there, there are aspects where the playfulness with how you tell that story shows two important things. One, you understand your business well enough that you can relate it to the real world. Two, you respect your audience. You understand that they haven't spent 15 years in, you know, grad school, PhD, industry to come do this. And if you understand your audience when you're pitching me as an investor, it gives me confidence that you understand your audience when you are pitching future employees, future investors, and then even customers who may not be technically as savvy or complex, right? Maybe you're selling your solution to salvage yards or to recycling plants. Those folks don't have PhDs. They are just 20-year operators in this industry. So you got to go to them and say, Joe, I'm selling Pac-Man for all of your unrecyclable salvage. And we yeah. want to go ahead and work on that. And here's how we'll show you how we do it. It gives me confidence as an investor that you know how to tell your story because you're able to make it relatable in a way that the average person can understand. It's difficult. It takes a skill. And oftentimes it takes somebody outside of your business because to you, you're working in it every single day. It's obvious to you. Yeah. When you come speak with somebody at VSC and you tell us that story, we go, well, that wasn't obvious to us, right? <laughs> and so you need that objectivity sometimes for someone to say, that, that thing that you said right there, that was the most compelling thing to me. Can we build your pitch around that compelling piece? It wasn't about all the scientific breakthroughs that you had. It was about that you do it five times faster than any process today. And you can explain why it's five times faster. You're taking the fast lane. You're taking the highway instead of taking the side streets. Okay, that makes sense to me. 
you've now explained your story to me in a way that I want to engage with it further. Yeah. I want to take a peek into the portfolio and hear a little bit about some of your favorite mm -hmm. companies and what they're up to that you're excited about. And that's potentially exciting for all of us. But I want to start through one commonality that some of them have. And this is your theory or your thesis on climate automation. That's yeah. something that you're excited about and you're looking at. So can you give us a brief overview of what the problem is that you see and kind of what the solution that you're envisioning looks like? One of the roles of a VC is you're looking 10 years ahead, right? Companies that you invest in today, can they become billion-dollar businesses in the future? So as I'm looking at a lot of disparate trends that I think are going to be kind of the defining trends of the next decade, right? When we come together again in 2035, hopefully we're both podcasting by then still, <laughs> we are going to talk about the impact of labor shortages especially in America, but you're seeing blue-collar, skilled labor shortages across the world. And the second is we're going to talk about the impact of climate shocks on legacy industries. So yeah. to say it kind of more plainly, we do not have enough people that want to work in skilled labor jobs like plumbing, electrician, manufacturing, trucking. We don't have enough of those people. The average age of a telephone pole worker is 59 years old. I'm thinking about my dad when he was 59. Could I even imagine him climbing up a telephone pole and the risk that he would be in doing that stuff? And the reason for that is we have spent three decades telling people to go get liberal arts educations and take out yeah. debt and go to college. And we haven't filled any interest in a vocational workforce behind them. And so we're missing those folks. We have immigration challenges in this country around legal immigration and illegal immigration. And as a result, we have done away with a lot of the, the backfill for these, which was primarily immigration from south of the border. And so those labor shortages that have already happened, coupled with the current workforce getting closer to retirement age, means that by some estimates, we are going to be 32 million American workers short by 2030. That is a crazy number. Now, even if you slice it or subslice it, I started looking at industries that had 100,000 to 300,000 labor shortages, like industrial painting or recycling, that had high turnover because these jobs were dirty, dusty, and dangerous. You know, yeah. you had to stand up in a cherry picker five stories high. And then as I looked at all those industries, I saw that they were all facing the same climate shocks as well. Disruptions to their supply chain, stresses to their manufacturing and operational processes, regulatory pressure on how they manage their waste or how they manage their operations and how much fossil fuels they're burning in order to keep their plants up and running, right? So climate automation came from this idea of saying, these same industries are facing two big challenges. And actually, those challenges are related. Because if these industries need to go through climate transition today, what do they need to do those transitions? Labor. Guess what they don't have? A labor workforce. And so to me, what that means is if we see that shortage coming, it's already here, but we see it getting massively exacerbated uh, over the next 10 years as this population retires, then we need to start investing in automation today at a much larger scale than these folks have ever done. The heartening thing to me is that decision makers at these legacy industries, be it in warehousing, manufacturing, trucking, shipping, logistics, recycling, commercial painting, they are all recognizing these shortages too. They are all forward thinking about their business and what it looks like yeah. over the next decade. And they are finally starting to invest in automation in a way that they probably should have done 10 years ago, but they're feeling the pain more acutely today, which means larger budgets, more willingness to try out new solutions, means more opportunities for startups that actually care about bringing automation and solving these job shortages in a way that will allow their customers to undertake the important climate transitions they need to. So hopefully yeah. that sort of paints the picture of where this thesis came from and, and why I think it's going to be really definitive of our next decade as we look ahead. I just happened to listen to a, a podcast covering kind of the current players in like where Tesla's going with it. You know, BMW made the investment of another one. So I'm fascinated by it. I'm sure I don't know a fraction of what you bring to the table. So give us a little bit of that landscape. Like how do you see the evolution of this sector? I would, do we want to call it a sector? I don't know. Because um, it feels like it's it's more a part of many sectors, possibly. I don't know. How, how do you look at this? How do you think of this? How do you talk about this on an industry organization level? And then let's talk about some specific examples. I think of it like an enabling technology. 
right? And so I think there are point solutions and there are system solutions like any enabling technology. Point solutions like with with Glacier or with um, you know PaintJet, which we spoke about, with Presso, right? And point solutions can actually get pretty big if they're in a really big market, right? I think point solutions yeah. sometimes gets thrown around as like a pejorative. I don't think that's the case. If you're in a really big market and you're solving a big problem, ultimately you can build really big reach in your niche. The kind of like system solutions are what I think about like a Boston Dynamics, right? right? It is a humanoid robot that is designed to mimic the way that human beings interact, right? And it's got legs and it's got arms and it sort of is able to handle multiple dexterous tasks in succession. And you can actually like program them to do that. Whereas a point right. solution is just doing one thing on a conveyor belt or one thing in an environment uh, again and again and again and again, and just does one thing really well. And maybe that one robot can be designed for four use cases and you just change the end effector, right? So right. this arm was doing painting. Now I change the end effector and it's doing power washing, right? But ultimately it's the same robot. Um, I think those system solutions are a little bit further away than we think. Like, I think Boston Dynamics has put out some really cool videos. You know, we used to joke internally that like, they're a robotics company that monetizes through viral videos. Uh, but they they actually have built some really cool robots and cobots that are able to operate alongside human beings safely. I think the question becomes about speed and efficiency, right? The, these five fingers, the four fingers and the thumb, they have allowed us to become the dominant species on this planet, right? Opposable thumbs, especially. Now, how quickly we're able to train a robot to think and operate at the speed of, of how quickly they think will actually affect if putting these system kind of solutions in deployment on yeah. a conveyor belt in a factory makes sense, right? Because as a human being, I can see a box, I can process that it's a box, and in my mind's eye, I know it has to go on this rack somewhere in the facility right? I can parallel process and, and contextually realize that it's I need to do that. And then I just go pick up the box and I move it. Yeah. And sure, there are challenges on that. The boxes are heavy. There's workers' compensation claims. If I throw out my lower back lifting this heavy box, fine. Today, there is a lot of computation that has to happen for the robot to do it. And right. the speed at which they do it may or may not make sense for a facility to integrate them. Down the line, at the rate at which computing is improving, at the rate at which AI is improving. Do I think we can get there? Yeah. What I can't handicap for you is the time scale that we'll get there on. Yeah. And that's where I think from an investor standpoint, those system solutions are a little bit harder for me to invest in today. Yeah. It is interesting to, to listen to, you know, early stage capital markets growth investors who are like putting a bet on in their DCF, Tesla's throwing out X millions of these per year by 2025 at a least rate of Y, and that's how you justify a multiple of whatever it is right now. We should also make sure to include, this is not in any way financial advice. We're not talking about investing here. <laughs> <laughs> Don't want to get anyone mad at me. But it is interesting that folks are making some of those leaps right now, and vastly different leaps, right? You'll hear some analysts say they'll be functional and, and this will be a marketplace and a genuinely profitable revenue stream for them by 2025, which seems to me, a little bit ambitious at the very least. Again, I think what I will say is they're cool and they're novel, and I don't know if they're useful yet. And useful is ultimately the most important thing. When a customer of one of our portfolio companies that's looking to put in that robotic solution, the idea is human beings are really good at creativity, at nonlinear thinking, at problem solving. That's what we should be using our highly evolved brains for. Robots are really good at repetitive tasks that have a defined start to finish that can be designed to be done over and over and over and over again. Where it doesn't make sense is to take that robot and try to make them problem solvers. Yes, you could. Theoretically, you could do it. But why would you want to, right? Like, we have human beings for this. And so ultimately, in the near future, I think those point solutions are really going to be where we invest our time and energy. Down the line, we may have more of these system solutions. You know, we'll get to a future like, what was that movie with Will Smith? iRobot, 
right? <laughs> and you get to a future where like there are these humanoid robots that are able to cook and clean and do all these things inside your home. And that makes sense, right? You can use the same robot for multiple use cases. Today, and probably for the next decade, we're talking about single use case robots that probably are more useful. And if you're somebody investing a hundred, two hundred thousand dollars in that solution, you got to be damn sure that it's going to be useful. Right. So I just I don't know if these humanoids are today. Sticking on kind of the automation theme, I think you know inv- certainly investors see a lot of promise and excitement in it. I think certain folks, whether they're people in the policy space here in Washington D.C. or just you know my mom, you think of this as a, as a bit of a dystopian future. And I'm curious as someone who thinks and talks about automation a lot, how do you articulate the kind of overarching win-win opportunities coming from automation in a way that captures the potential, appreciates the potential risk, but also puts people's minds at ease. You know, you're a storyteller as well. How do you think about that and talk about that? I think you have to meet people where they are when they are sharing these fears, right? Whenever we see or share a video of an interesting robotic solution, whether it's in our portfolio or I just see something cool and I share it on LinkedIn, you know, so often you see comments that are like, well, there goes another person's job, right? There goes a landscaper because here's a robotic Roomba that cuts your grass, whatever that company was called. You know, you have to recognize that there is that fear and you have to recognize that people who have been doing the same job for 40 years, making good living off of it, they have pensions, all this kind of stuff, they are genuinely worried about what the future is going to look like and whether or not that future is going to involve them. And I think the true conversation is it can involve them, but they have to be willing to evolve with the future, right? And, And that may not be a heavy lift. That may be, hey, instead of being the person that actually does the landscaping, you learn to be the person that manages the the robots that do the landscaping, right? And and there's some upskilling that that you can have inside of your job to do that. And that may be interesting to them, that may be not, right? The second piece of this that I think is important to consider, there just aren't that many people that want to do these jobs. And the people that are currently doing these jobs are on pace to retire faster right. than Anything that we've seen between, I think, Pew Research and Brookings Institute, we've seen numbers as high as 15 to 17 million skilled trade labor is going to retire in America in the next decade. 17 million people who know how to be plumbers and electricians and utilities workers and manufacturing and warehouse associates, like these folks are just going to retire. And we don't have people to backfill these jobs. So you can lead with kind of the empathy to say, listen, if this is a future you want to be a part of, there will be roles in this future for you. Because truthfully, not a lot of people want these jobs. And so if you want a job, you can find a role within this new automation future that is there. But the truth of the matter is, we have an entire generation of people behind the boomers and Gen Xers that are going to retire that want you know, white collar jobs, laptop jobs. They don't want to be in a warehouse. They don't want to be working in a facility. They don't want to be out on a construction site. So we're going to need robotic point solutions to make up for that shortfall. That's really, honestly, the truth of it. The facts don't always assuage people's feelings. I get that, right? As a storyteller, you then have to say that there is room for you in this future because the way the facts lay it out we're going to need people like you. And if you want to continue to work in the utility sector, then there will be a job for you. It may look different than the job you have today, but there will be a job for you. I mean, sometimes our collective memories are short, but it wasn't that long ago that an entire generation had total skepticism about the computer and the internet. Here we are, you know, with a computer in our pocket, right? Even the boomers have them now. But, you know, (laughs) if you had told boomers that 40 years ago that they're be walking around with a computer in their pocket to do everything. They wouldn't have believed it. So hopefully there's also an element of just, to your point, evolution, social systemic evolution that will accompany this, that will make it a, a transition that is equitable for folks, despite how scary it might be. I think the scariest part of it is how 
quickly everything is shifting. You've heard the boiling frog analogy, right? If you you put a frog in boiling water and you turn it up slowly and slowly and slowly, the, the rate of change being slow enough, the frog doesn't notice, right? Unfortunately, the rate of change in technology and software and AI today is so fast and it's being covered at this breakneck speed because we are in a 24-hour media cycle. We have podcasts and video content yeah. and all this stuff. We're processing so much and... That's really hard for somebody to kind of say, like, I don't recognize the world that I am in. And I feel like every few months it changes. Yeah. And so not to like get into the political side of it, I understand the political anxiety from unions yeah. and labor workers and skilled labor. Like, I get it. Unfortunately, the political class uses it as a way to garner yeah. votes, which is a whole other issue. But Ultimately, like it's not unfounded to say, I like my life and I see it changing in a direction that I'm not necessarily comfortable with. Does that mean I have to change? And change is scary. And you don't know if that change is going to be successful. And so there's almost like a psychological flight to safety to say, no, I reject automation. I reject robotics. When in reality, the future that's going to be created may leave more time for you and more time for your family it may also mean that less people need to work at a certain company. And I, I don't reject that that's a scary feeling, right? Yeah. When you feel like, wow, does that mean that I won't have a future here? Yeah. You know, you see a ton of businesses, you get a ton of pitches, you get to look at the tip of the spear in terms of what really smart people are thinking about in terms of building products that could make a, a more sustainable future. I'm curious, what technologies, what innovations, what revolutions are out there that you're seeing people start to bring to the venture capital world? What's exciting you and giving you hope that there's a, a path of innovation that could make a much better, more sustainable future for us? I think I can give you on one on the technology side and I'll give you one on the business model side. So I'll tell you about the business model side. For a long time, purchasing has been done via procurement in a lot of these legacy industries. And so what that means is, you know, you, you bid, there is a price tag, you know, 200K, you know, 250K. That's what it's going to cost. Here's the setup. Here's our long-term kind of SLA and, and how we're going to service your machine once we put it in. I've started seeing the winds change towards what folks are calling RAS, robotics as a service, that I think is really compelling. One, it creates ongoing revenue stream for the company, right? It's recurring, which yeah. is really meaningful because as an investor, uh, recurring revenue streams are always easier to invest in than, you know, lumpy. One month you have revenue, one month you don't. It costs a lot to build. You don't know if you're going to be able to sell it. That uncertainty makes it hard to back sometimes. So I think the as a service revolution may be a strong word, but uh, proclivity that's changing with some of these, these acquirers. I think is really promising. And I think there's a theory or a reason for why that's happening. A lot of these old school legacy businesses, the, these boiler maker plants and these concrete plants and industrial painting apparatuses, they were owned by an older generation. And now as that generation starts to retire, either their kids are taking over or they're selling it to private equity and a search fund comes in and puts in a 28-year-old MBA to run it. Those folks are thinking about innovations and in how they operate their business the same way that the startups that we're backing are operating this yeah. business. So I think that generational shift is necessitating new business models. And those new business models are creating more venture backable opportunities in things like robotics and hardware, you know, uh, robotics as a service. And so that's pretty compelling to me. I think on the, the other piece, you know, I, I gave you a good example with Concrete AI, but I do think there are some really creative applications of AI that go beyond LLMs and chat GPT and, and sort of the stuff that we see today, you know, creating inference in markets that, that don't exist today. And so we're looking at something in the law enforcement space recently. You know, today, law enforcement bulletins, when there is, let's say, a robbery or a carjacking or something that happens, these bulletins are sent out almost in a PDF format. We just learned about that earlier this week. Huh, it blew yeah. my mind, right? But why is it PDF? <laughs> it's because Everybody uses a different system. So the state right. troopers use a different system than local PD. Let's say it happens in New Brunswick, New Jersey. You got to alert the Rutgers state, the, the campus police about it. Everybody uses a different system. 
there are opportunities for technical innovation in those systems where now not only can you say, okay, let's get off of PDFs and let's turn it into some kind of a software system, but take it one step further and say, now that I know all of the historical data in these PDFs, we've extracted it, we can actually lay out some trend lines. Are we seeing yeah. more kinds of crimes happening in certain areas? Why are we seeing that? What is the nature of this crime that necessitates that it happens here? And then from a policing standpoint, giving folks the opportunity to be proactive instead of reactive. And so I think every one of these industries, there's an opportunity for there to be technical innovation in a way that it hasn't happened before. And people used to think technical innovation is, oh, we just moved our system onto software. No, there, there's the ways that that software actually informs the work that you do every day and makes you smarter. And it doesn't have to just rely on the instinct of the officer in this instance to know, hey, don't park on this street because this is a dangerous street for whatever reason. It should go beyond that to say, okay, how, well, how do we manage that risk better? How do we manage our policing better? So yeah. I think AI... We're just scratching the surface on how it can actually make an impact in the real world. Today, it's great for like copywriting and, you know, editing and that kind of stuff. But I want to see where AI starts to actually impact the ways that we make our cities safer, we make our neighborhoods more inclusive, and we're actually just, you know, generally using these insights to live better lives in the real world, not just on our computers. Well, and just looking at models that make the world a better place, right? Like in the back of my mind, I was, as you were talking about the, the crime one, like, at least I'm not using fax machines. That would, <laughs> was where I thought you were going to go. <laughs> uh, no, some, some of them maybe. still are, man. Uh, yeah, some of the more yeah. rural places, uh, they still send these bulletins by fax. I'm, <laughs> I'm meeting the founder for the first time on Monday. My, my associate met him this week. Um, but, but it was one of those things where I was like, you know, this is a, a, a prime example, um, a prime example of founder market fit, right? How many people actually understand how law enforcement happens on a technical basis, right? You know that an officer right. shows up when the 911 is called. What is happening in the background? And how is it making sure that they know everything they need to know about the situation so they show right. up knowing how to be prepared and how to make sure they keep people safe? And and from a PR and standpoint, safe for everyone, yeah. I mean, the reason they, they want to think about working with us is obviously, you know, PDs across the US have not gotten the best rep over the last five, yeah. eight years for, for good reason. Yeah. There is a, a, an important story to be told here that, hey, this is not about more surveillance. This is actually about better informing the actions we take when we get there and limiting the exposure that a community needs to have to like officers on the ground every day. So instead of just yeah. throwing bodies at the problem, we are actually throwing technology at the problem, which yeah, I, I think data, is information. Yeah. Talk about some of the portfolio companies that you were most excited about because they're helping find solutions towards a more sustainable future in, in general, whether that's in the, the climate automation space or just any of your other investments that you're super yeah. psyched about right now. Yeah, I mean, I, I hinted the, the concrete example earlier, right? But generative AI gets very buzzy these days and, and everybody wants to back yeah. the next gen AI company. We were thrilled to meet a founder that was applying the power of AI into an industry that really for a long time does things by tribal knowledge. So here's an example the concrete mix generation and management. What is concrete made of, right? It's made of really five ingredients, uh, cement, hard aggregate like gravel, soft aggregate like sand, chemical admixtures, and water, right? To simplify. Well, cement is actually a very important piece of concrete because it's actually the glue that's holding everything together. It's the thing that allows it to harden faster and kind of fills in between the rocks and the cracks. The bigger problem is cement accounts for something like 42% of the cost and 92% of the carbon emissions of a cubic yard of concrete. And one of these facilities is sending out the door somewhere between 2,000 and 3,000 cubic yards a day, right? Yeah. So if you can bring down the percentage of cement in a given block of concrete, uh, you can massively cut down on cost and even more massively cut down on carbon emissions, which then, one, helps these concrete manufacturing plants be more profitable and also helps them access credits that are out yep. there for being more green, right? In a meaningful way where you can actually tie it back to their practices. And it's not just, hey, you planted X number of trees and we think a tree is worth this many credits. I can literally tell you today, I cut down my volume of cement by this much. And therefore, we know the positive impact of limiting yeah. those pollutants. What I loved about this team was first that founder market fit, right? 
The founder spent 17 years in this industry. He was the head of mix optimization at one of the largest concrete ready mix companies. He worked up and down that value chain, working with aggregates, working with the plant managers. And um, also while he was in these roles, had been collaborating with researchers at UCLA on building a, a massive data set of concrete mix performances. So one example is if you're building a sidewalk versus building the column inside of a potential skyscraper, right? They need different thicknesses. A sidewalk doesn't have to have a high PSI strength. It doesn't also have to set right away. But if you're building a high rise, it makes a massive difference if that concrete sets in seven days versus 14, right? If it's 14, you've literally doubled how long it takes you to put in the next floor. Yeah. And so what happens today is because some of this is done by tribal knowledge, people over-engineer their mixes. They err on the side of safety, but they actually have the opportunity to scale that back because the models will tell you, you'll still be within your safety margins, but you can cut down your cement by 5%, right? That'll save you on cost. That'll save you on carbon. What Concrete AI has done is taken this massive data set that's proprietary to them, their, their relationship with UCLA, and turned it into a easy dashboard that connects into these plant manufacturers and their inventory systems to come in and tell them, based on what you have in your inventory and based on the client specs, this is the mix that you're using. Here's how we would optimize it. That's stage one. Stage two is, based on all of the client opportunities you could bid on, here are the mixes we suggest that you could make. And so now you're actually helping them unlock new opportunities. And then beyond that is to actually full stack suggest new materials. Hey, there is a more carbon-friendly cement out there. We would recommend that you use it and it becomes a channel partnership opportunity. Yeah. So I'm thrilled about, I think, the massive opportunity for Concrete AI, not just in America, but they've already started getting inquiries about, you know, uh, construction in Brazil, construction in India, um, where new construction methods are just starting to be adopted. I, I heard a really great anecdote last night. There's an entrepreneur here in New York that moved over to Ghana because for a long time in Ghana, construction was being done in an older way, kind of bricklaying formats. And he basically wanted to go there and do poured concrete. And he said, I'm bringing the best practices of kind of Western skyscraper construction to a country that just doesn't have the in-house know-how to do that. And he's become tremendously successful just by bringing the practice that is so commonplace here right. to a country where it's not commonplace because he's able to do it faster and he's able to still meet all of the building requirements that are needed. So there is such a massive international opportunity. You know, think about as a listener where you are right now. You are no more than a couple of yards from concrete at any given time. It is all around us. And those are the kind of industries that I really love where it's the hidden kind of world around us that we don't think about, but somebody thinks about them. And those are the kind of founders I like to back because they think really deeply about those problems. And the ubiquity of those problems means that it's going to be a massive business if it succeeds. It's also interesting to me, I think we share this in common, that finding opportunity and, and a pathway for progress through the capital markets. But I feel like so many people have either demonized that as part of the problem and never can it be part of the solution, or people in that space have no interest in looking beyond their wallet at the end of the day to actually see what impact or what return can mean beyond just the dollar. But it's refreshing to have conversations with folks who understand like the financial markets, capital markets, they are one of the greatest tools we could possibly have to propel positive change towards a more sustainable future if we harness them correctly. And so I appreciate having your perspective kind of to illustrate that in a real meaningful way. I tell my LPs I'm a cold-blooded capitalist, man. Like I, I want to return money to my investors who have taken a chance on me and backed me because they believe that I am good at what I'm doing, right? And so from that perspective, you can't just come in here and say, well, we're spreading money around because these are good causes. Every company that we are investing in, we are evaluating as a business. You know, when I answered your question earlier, I said, the positive impact to me is just too obvious and too obvious to anybody in our portfolio to say, yeah, of course, if this company builds a massive business, the yeah. world will be better for it. Okay, great. That's all I need to know. That's all I need to ask. Now let's go back to being a cold-hearted capitalist yeah. and let's go ahead and, and make sure this company succeeds. What is the kind of conversation like with the LPs on that front? 
Are your LPs the standard LPs? Or do you have LPs that have a very specific vision uh, for the future? Or are you talking to the, the offices that everyone else is talking to, the funds everyone else is talking to, to raise from? And what gets them excited about your fund specifically? Look, I think it's a mix of things, right? We, we have uh, individuals, family offices, high net worth. In our first fund, we didn't have any kind of traditional institutional investors. We did have family offices that are very active investing on the fund side. Different folks care about different things. Sure. I think the most consistent thing that our LPs cared about, given how many of them were former founders, operators, investors themselves, is the storytelling and PR aspect, yeah. where they said, wow, that is something that I don't see really anybody offering in a meaningful way. And I don't see anybody putting resources like you have behind their founders to help them with their storytelling and their PR and their go-to-market. So that's the number one thing that resonated. I think the majority of our investors also really like the industrial automation focus, the hidden economies focus. Yeah. They think that's really cool. They, they like that we're being non-consensus looking at those kinds of businesses. And then I think there's a subset that really do care about the climate impact, right? They want to feel good about where they're putting their money. Some of these folks have made so much money, they could retire into the sunset, never make another investment again. But if they're going to put their capital to work, they want to do it somewhere where they feel like, okay, I feel good not only about the capital return, but I also know these companies are kind of no-brainer going to be better for the world. I think that makes it a sweetener in the conversation. I don't ever think that it's the thing that we lead with where we say, invest in us because of the climate aspect. No, we are at our core value. Our superpower is storytelling. That's the reason that they're coming to us. The added benefit is that our companies are going to be building positive impact in addition to building really great businesses. Yeah. So let's end on a story. I want to know, I won't make you put a, a timestamp on it, but if you were to close your eyes and paint a picture for what a successful, sustainable future looks like, what your companies are doing, what your portfolio is doing, what the country is doing, what the world's doing, what does it look like? Tell us that story. Tell us what a sustainable future is. What does success look like for all of us if we all do what, we, what we're doing right now and do it better and better and better? Where do we get? I mean, I can tell you tangibly what it looks like, and it looks like nuclear energy. Realistically, if you just sit there and listen to the scientists or do the math yourself and you realize the energy hours that we need to enact the sustainable future that we want, realistically, you know, we would have to cover like Australia in solar panels end to end to be able to achieve a fraction of that, right? And what we do actually have and can do meaningfully, not just in this country, but around the world, is harness nuclear energy. And on my show, we had Fred Lalonde, who uh, made a very salient point. He said, the biggest challenge is that the name of the bomb and the name of the energy source are exactly the same, right? Nuclear bomb, nuclear energy. But the way we harness that energy is very, very different in the way that we do it in something destructive like a bomb and something productive like energy. So I can tell you very clearly, I am a pro-nuclear energy, like unabashed person. I also think from a PR and storytelling standpoint, nuclear energy has a massive PR problem. And it's something that as a generation, my generation, our generation can do a better job educating ourselves on, yeah. hey, this energy can be in our, in our homes, in our areas. You know, one-off disasters like Fukushima, like Three Mile Island, things like that are avoidable. And within the sort of acceptable margins of risk, when we go ahead and talk about powering an entire country for the future that we need, right? We want to talk about powering EVs. You know, some of these EV charging stations are powered by coal and oil and gas, right? So yes, you're getting EV charging, but what is the source of that energy? So to me, man, the most sustainable energy future is one where we have nuclear energy, where we are able to power the world around us, where we're able to incentivize more people to choose a cleaner energy source and not have to worry about the externalities of pollution that come from the oil and gas industry and the existing industry, energy infrastructure. That's, I think, where I'll leave it. That's the utopian future to me, is that we are accepting that 
this resource exists today and the nimbyism gives way to education and understanding mm-hmm. and acceptance of like, this is the only way we get there. Otherwise, you know, it, it's a fool's errand. Yeah. Where do we want to send folks to learn more about what you're up to? Obviously, we're going to put into the show notes a whole host of portfolio companies that we've talked about. I think those are all going to be exciting people. But where do we send folks to get uh, more info and, and learn? Totally. You can find our website, VSC Ventures. You can see all of our portfolio companies there. I would love for you to follow me on Twitter and LinkedIn. That's where I put out all of our content and our stories. And then if you want to continue hearing these kinds of conversations, um, I have a weekly show called Climb, where I interview investors, entrepreneurs, industry experts about exactly these kinds of conversations. We're, We're talking about building and scaling meaningful companies in climate and industrial automation. So come come find me on Climb by VSC if you search on any of your, your podcast platforms. That's where you can check us out. And obviously, again, we'll, we're going to, this will be a, a epic show note with lots of links. So we'll, <laughs> that one will be in there too. Thanks so much for not just taking the time, but taking the time twice so we can have an extra long conversation. Um, it's been a lot of fun. So I really appreciate it. This was really it. great, man. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the great questions and uh, for, for engaging on these topics, man. I, I, I love what you're doing with the show. Um, love some of the guests that you've had on. So uh, look forward to continue supporting the show. Once again, my biggest thanks to Jay Kapoor for joining us on the show these past two weeks. We've had so much fun diving in on these incredibly interesting and important topics like hidden economies and climate automation. Jay gave us such a depth of information and perspective on these subjects, and I honestly suspect we're still just scratching the surface. Like he said, hopefully both of us are still podcasting in 10 years, so stay tuned for the follow-up. Let's see how much we both got right. Maybe even a little sooner than that, who knows? In the meantime, if you want to hear more from Jay, do check out his podcast, Climb by BSC which is available wherever you get your podcasts. It's a fantastic show with Jay and his VSC Ventures co-founder, Vijay Chatta, having conversations a lot like ours. Digging in on entrepreneurship and company building with investors, founders, and experts in the climate, tech, and impact spaces. If you like our show, you're going to love his, so definitely give it a listen. You can also learn more about Jay's work with VSC Ventures and his portfolio companies at their website, vscventures.com. And you can connect with Jay himself on LinkedIn at Jay Kapoor or on the app formerly known as Twitter at Jay Kapoor NYC. We'll have links for you in the show notes. As always, if you have questions, comments, or ideas sparked by today's conversation or a great idea for a future conversation, please email us at cic at consensus-digital.com. That's cic at consensus-digital.com. Or you can connect with me directly on LinkedIn and threads at ckgone. That's at C-K-G-O-N-E. We'd love for you to reach out and join the community. And finally, if you like the show today, please give us a follow, a like, and leave a review wherever you listen. It helps us to grow our reach and continue bringing you more awesome conversations with the business leaders that you want to hear from. Thanks, everyone. We'll be back next week with a brand new conversation. Consensus and Conversation is hosted and executive produced by me, Connor Gaughan. The episode was produced by Will Gatchell and Jeff Rock with editing from the good folks at Reasonable Volume. Special thanks to the Consensus team, including Creative Director Kate Tucker, Greg Hurgle on Research, and Patrick Gallagher on Strategy. Consensus in Conversation can be found on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you listen. Consensus in Conversation is a podcast by Consensus Digital Media, produced in association with Reasonable Volume.